thankful for the blood of Jesus. Hey. Amen. I have to give you a quick background of something humorous that you may find it humorous that I probably didn't, but I was in my office today and I my wife bought me this beautiful wood wick candle. I love candles. You probably smell it every time you walk by. But you know, I had to blow it out because I was leaving. And it was I mean it's the biggest wick I've ever seen in my life. So I was like and I blew it, and I mean, just wax everywhere. So if you see me picking, it went all over my face. So I was a little bit self-conscious about it. If you smell apple wood, that's me. All right, so I just figured I'd, you know, give you that humorous story in my, what's the word? I don't know. Yeah, at my expense. All right, so tonight, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, talking about let God in. So let's pray and we'll get right into the message. <coughs> Dear God, I pray that you'd help me. God, I pray that you'd help us as a church, God, to really heed this message. And God, this isn't aimed at anybody. God, I know you gave me this message a long time ago. And, and Pastor just mentioning it, you know, if I wanted to preach one Sunday night, God, I already knew that you've laid this message on my heart for this reason. And God, I need it desperately and we all need it. And God, I pray that we'd heed to it. And God, I pray that we would just see you and all that God that nobody would recognize me or see me that they would hear from you tonight God I pray you get all the honor and glory for it and God I pray you be with my words and God I pray you fill me with the Holy Ghost and God I pray you give me an unction God from you to give the message to this people God I pray you bless this church God I thank you that we were able to have Sunday school today God what a blessing that was to just sit together and just really teach and learn about the Word of God and having everybody together God and and bless God for coffee, God. I just thank you for the wonderful time that we had today, God. How well it went and how well it ran. We know it's a lot of work that goes into it. Thank you for that. God, I thank you for the workers. I pray you bless them. God, I pray you give us more workers, God. I pray you give us more people that we can see saved and baptized. And God, I pray you bless this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3. We'll start in verse 14. And the angel of the Lord of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Lord. That the amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that were cold or hot. So that because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. And knowest that thou art wretched, and knows not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness did not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that they may, thou, thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame, I am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So just give you a quick background. This is, uh, John wrote this. It's the only prophetical book in the New Testament. And the Apostle John here is writing this book and this chapter specifically to these churches. And this is the section talking to the Laodicean church. And, and you got to be careful sometimes because a lot of revelation isn't here. This is what it means. And a lot of people take it and run with it. Hey, I think it means this and I think it means that. But, you know, we take a, a literal interpretation of the Bible. You know, and say, oh, well, I can make that. In Revelation, you really can make it say whatever you want. So make sure you have a good interpretation and don't just say, oh, like, I'll make this one up or this guy's mentioned this and I'll follow that. No, make sure you, you study it out. And that's why I want to just, you know, give you a warning. Really, you know, people say, oh, well, this is this church age and this is this church age. And that's a great application. That's a great, you know, maybe we can read between the lines there and get some good profound deep knowledge of the bible but the bible doesn't specifically say oh this is the church age but you know but we can read it you know deeper things of scripture but you know that's not a as you say a hill that i would die on because it's not right there in the bible and also what we're going to go through tonight is the Laodicea is, is a city it's a church that uh john not paul you know you always think it's paul but it's not john here is speaking to now he, we're going to look just quickly in verse 16 uh, sorry yes in verse 16 so then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. 
I would spew thee out of my mouth. Now, interestingly enough, the city of Laodicea doesn't have a domestic, meaning their own, source of water. So they would have to get their source of water from a surrounding city. And there was the one city is, I'm going to say it right, is Heropolis. It's in the north, and they had hot springs. It was soothing, you know, sit in a spa or a hot tub. And they were known for that. And they were known for their hot springs and the water that they would get from there. But also they had another city neighboring them called Colossae. And they had mountains with snow-capped mountains and the snow would melt, and they would have cold, refreshing water. And we see here that um, the Laodicea was in the middle, and, and it would have the Roman uh, aqueducts that would channel water to that city. But by the time the Heropolis hot, wonderful water that they could make tea out of, or the refreshing cold water from Colossae got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. It, it, you know, it's not going to travel until we cold. They didn't have the refrigerator trucks that we have today. And what, what Jesus is saying, hey, you know that lukewarm water that you drink? You know, maybe they took a trip to Heropolis or they took a trip to Colossae and they had that good water. But you know that lukewarm water that you drink? Jesus says, that's what I think about you. He says, well, it's just not that appetizing. It's not that great. It's just okay. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Now, we've heard messages. You know, you're, you're in the middle. You're not cold for Jesus or you're hot, hot for Jesus. And that's a great application, but don't you know mix that up with the interpretation of the passage. Now, I understand my interpretation, as I'm going to preach tonight, is that they are an undesirable church. Meaning Jesus looks at them and he just is like a cold cup of coffee where it's just been sitting out all day. Now, me, I'll drink it. I don't care. I love coffee. But yeah, it's just not as good as a hot cup of coffee and it's fresh, you know, a fresh hot cup of coffee or maybe you just Took it out of the microwave. But think of it, cold. I thought of it this way. A diner cup of coffee. We all know what diner coffee tastes like. Some people love it. I like it. I don't mind it. And then they're like, oh, I want to top you off. And yeah, I don't put cream, extra sugar, nothing. I just love it. But if it sits there for a while and it gets cold and bleh, and then you drink it, it's like, wow, that is not great. That is what Jesus is saying to these churches. Like, you're lukewarm water. You're not great. You're not, you're not appetizing. So I just want to give you that background as we go into this story. Jesus was highly displeased with the state of the church so much that he called John right to them. Hey, they need to fix these things. And it made him want to spew. I literally studied it, looked it up in the Greek. It just means vomit. It just means it wants to forcibly expel them out of his mouth. Hopefully none of us want Jesus to say that about us. I mean, that was the latest thing in church. He said, man, you're just, you're so unappetizing to me. You're not doing a whole lot. You're just kind of there. You're just kind of getting by. He said, I'm going to spew thee out of my mouth. So watch for misinterpretation here. This is a, a message to the church. Now this is, you know, the Bible is for the Christian. We understand that. But the interpretation we see here in the end of verse 22, what the Spirit says to the churches. So when we hear that, you know, Jesus is knocking, or when we hear that here it was a lukewarm, that's all talking to the church. Now obviously we are the individuals. The church is the body of Christ, and we can make that application. But just remember, this passage, and as we're going to go through, is talking to the church. Jesus is knocking at the door. That's what we're going to focus on tonight. That, we'll read it one more time in verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And I will sup with him and he with me. I'm just going to, on this, focus on this topic of let God in. Let God into your life. Let God into this church. I mean, God wants to get involved. God wants to show up. And as I heard a preacher say, God will show up and show off. He didn't say, hey, watch it. I do not in a proud manner, but saying, hey, look, you tried to do this in your own strength. Get me involved in amazing things can happen. Indescribable things happen when God gets involved. When God says, hey, I'll take over that ministry or I'll take over that job that you have to do or that, that person that needs help. Hey, let me get involved indescribable things can happen. You'll find yourself saying, man, I don't even know what just happened. I mean, that was amazing. I think of a time in my life when I, I somebody just came to me for counseling. Why? Well, I have no idea. But they did. And they're like, hey, what do you think about this situation? I say, like, well, I was praying about it. And I really felt the Holy Spirit led me to say something specific. And I told them that. And they're like, wow, that helped me so much. And what did I say? I didn't say, oh, I know, I'm pretty smart. I was like, well, God told me to say that. It was indescribable for me. Every little situation, every big situation, Get God involved. Let God in. So number one here, and believe it or not, I have slides, just the main points. Opposition to the invitation. Opposition to the invitation. In verse 14 through 19. So we don't get to the invitation to let God in 
until verse 20. Why? Because there's some opposition. There's some things in this church's life in Laodicea and the, the people of the church of Laodicea. There's some things in their lives that is stopping Jesus from coming in. Or he would have never wrote it. He would have said, oh, I knocked and I went and then we had great revival and it was a wonderful church service. And, you know, that church really was woken up and they were doing great things. No, Jesus said, I was knocking. I was knocking. And, and he didn't get to the invitation until we had all the opposition to that invitation. Uh, a quote by Oswald Chambers. God did not direct his call to Isaiah. Isaiah overheard God saying, who will go for us? The call of God is not just for a select few, but for everyone. Whether I hear God's call or not depends on the condition of my ears. And exactly what I hear depends upon my spiritual attitude. And why I say it is because the God getting into the church, God getting into our lives, the call is for everybody. God, God doesn't leave anybody out. God doesn't knock only on the preacher's door or just on the deacon's door. No, God is knocking on everybody's door. God is knocking on every church in America's door. Say, hey, let me in. I want to get involved. God wants to get involved in your life. None of us are, unless you're not saved, God wants to get involved in your heart and he wants to save you. But if you are saved, and I realize this is a Sunday night crowd and we're faithful, God wants to get involved in your life. So number one is opposition to invitation. Under that is a knowledgeable condition. A knowledgeable condition. Letter A, a knowledgeable condition. It says in verse in verse 16, oh, verse 15, I know thy works. A knowledgeable condition. God knows what we're doing. God knows if we're doing great or we're not doing great. God knows if we're slacking or God knows if we're going you know, gung-ho, doing everything with all every ounce of energy that we have. God knows if we're Getting up in the morning and reading, you know, you can fake that, to, you know, you can hide it from other people, but you know, God knows what we're doing. And I realized they, they used to tell us in Bible college, you know, you'll know who is spiritual and who isn't. Why? Because well, we were literally this far from apart, our beds, and we had get this, twelve people in one room. It was a blessing. It was a wonderful time in Bible college. Actually, I loved it because I was, you know, gone before everyone went to bed. But what, the, what, what does that mean? It means we know what everybody's doing. I knew who got up and read their Bible. I knew who prayed at night. I, why? Because we're so close. Why? Well, think of it even on a greater scale. God knows what you're doing. God knows if you want to search after him. God even knows your heart, not just the outward. God knows the inward, and God knows your work. Is he happy with it? Or is he displeased? It's just like, oh, my goodness, that's lukewarm water. That is an unappetizing Christian. I, I strive to really, you know, my life that when God looks at it, God is pleased. And I know I'm not perfect. There's times in my life when I, I, can, I know God is displeased with me. And that's what we need to strive to fix. Why? Because we want God. We want God to get involved. We want God to get into this church, get into our lives. But we have to know, hey, God knows what we're doing. So God knows our works. God knows where you are and what you're doing. God is omnipresent. He's always there. He's everywhere. And he's omniscient. He knows everything. Okay. You know, if we don't believe that, that's the problem. If we say, oh, well, you know, God didn't see that. Yes, he did. God sees everything. You can never fake it to God. God knows everything about you. God knows everything about his church. So knowledgeable condition, and let it be under there, is a lukewarm condition. And as I said before, I believe this lukewarm condition is not just somebody who's in the middle of on fire and not on fire. I think it's somebody who is unappetizing to God. Somebody who God is just like, you're okay. You're, you're not on, you know, I understand why people say it, you know, you're not on fire, but, you're, but they take that verse sometimes and say, God would rather you be cold. I think God is happy when someone's trying and, and striving to get closer, but they're just not there yet. But someone who is just okay, and I've already gave the illustration, it's just old diner coffee, it's just blah. They were okay with being okay. God looked at the Laodicean church and they were just kind of doing their thing, you know, not... Believe in God for great, amazing things, and they were okay with that. You know, that is the worst thing that we can get to as Christians, as a church, is when we're just okay with being okay. When we're just okay with just doing what we're doing and not seeing amazing things. And I believe that God wants to do amazing things, and God's going to do amazing things Amen. if we let him in. I, I just think of, a Pastor gave a testimony today, I was in his office of somebody who wanted to get saved this morning. What a blessing that is. And, you know, and God wants to do something. In our church, and he's going to, and I believe that whole part of it, we just have to let him in. So, a lukewarm condition. Don't be okay with being okay. You'll strive to be all out for God. Amen. Don't over moralize this because it doesn't mean that they, so don't over moralize it because it means they were not appetizing to God. 
They were not desirable to God. Now, God loves everybody. God wants everybody. But your Christian life, does he look at it and say, man, that's what I'm looking for? Or does he say, that needs some work? Now, I'm going to say, I'm not preaching this from a perfect position. We all know that. Ask my wife. But I, we, we all need some work, myself included. Are you desirable to God? Is that important to you? You know, I thought about it. Is that, is that even on the top of your list? And it needs to be. Your priority ought to be, man, I want to be as appetizing as I can be to God. I mean, God created you. God gave his life for you. We ought to give our life back to him. And we ought to want to. And you say, hey, I'm here. I'm, it's Sunday night. I got work tomorrow. It's 6 o'clock. I understand that. But hey, what are you doing the rest of the week? Well, what has God called you to do in this church? We're opening stuff back. We're, you know, I heard a lot of people in you know, different ministries. Hey, I could use some help. Or I'm scrambling for helpers. Hey, get involved. Hey, you say, I don't know where to get involved. Ask Pastor. I'm sure he's got a job for you. Ask me. I'm sure I got a job for you. Ask God. God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Are you just, uh, is that important to you? And then letter C under here is a prideful condition. And this is really where it struck me. Hey, this is, this is what their problem was in verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. When you have need of nothing, you no longer need God in your life. And that's the low point for a Christian to say, man, I'm doing good. I am okay. I don't need anything. I I'm rolling right along. And then you say, hey, uh, you don't say it. You may not even know it. But you come to a point where you think you don't need God. And that's the prideful condition that these people are in. A prideful condition. La oh, that's what I wanted to say. Laodicean church, the city of Laodicea, was very known for their banks. You know, they had a lot of banks. They had a lot of money. They say they were rich people. They were also known for very good schooling. They, they would have been very proud people that said, oh, I went to this school. Or, you know, people would travel to there to go to certain schools or different banks that they had. Well, that attitude got them to where they are. That got them where they, hey, we don't need anything. We don't even need God. We got all this wonderful stuff. And us in America can get to that same situation. Hey, we don't need God. We got everything we need. Why do I have to pray for food? I just go to McDonald's. They got a, well, they used to have a dollar menu, but they got the, the value menu or whatever it is. You know, we, as American Christians, we're pretty well off and we're pretty well blessed. And that's a great thing. But don't let it get to a point where you don't need God. We need God. A prideful condition is somebody who thinks they don't need God. In junior church today, we talked about pride. The simplest way I can say, tell those kids is put yourself last and put God and others first. Pride is when you put yourself out of the way and say, hey, God, what do you want? God, I don't care what I want. I want to do what you want to do. You say, well, am I not important? Well, when it comes to you and God, no. Paul says, I am nothing. If a man thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing. And God spoke to my heart with that verse, man, well, I am nothing. You say, oh, that's terrible. No, 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 I don't need a self-help book. I just need God. I don't need high self-esteem, and obviously that's okay to have, but you know, not to a point where you're prideful, but why? Because we just need God. We just need to God to get into our lives and God to get involved in everything we do. That, when God put this message on my heart, that's what I've realized. And, and God gets involved in my ministry. That's great. And God gets involved in my marriage. And God gets involved with my personal devotions. But God wants to be involved in everything you do. And even I thought that even my morning routine when I wake up, oh, sure. God rather you listen to good Christian music or some preaching than uh, maybe something you shouldn't listen to. Just something simple that God wants to be involved and all that you do, driving to work, well, I put on the Christian radio. Amen. God wants to be involved in all that you do. Hey, I thought about this, and I wrote it down here. You can never be too radical about God. Hey. You can never say, man, I got God involved in too many things. Hey. No, that's not even a thing. You can get God involved in every aspect of your life. That's how we let God in when he's knocking. Because you, when you get to a point, you say, God, you're not involved in this part of my life. That's shutting the door on now, if Jesus walked through that door, we wouldn't shut the door on him. But in our lives, when we say, God, this is my time, that's shutting the door on him. Prideful condition. Man, I'm skipping all over the place. <laughs> just getting by. Prideful condition. They, I said it before. They were just getting by. They were just, eh, okay, I'll go to church. Hey, you know, if, if, if it's a good message, that's fine. Now, every message, hey, let's hear from God tonight. It's not just yeah. pastor's responsibility. It's not just a pastoral staff. It's our responsibility as a church, hey, I'm going to pray before I go to church and meet with God. You know, they used to tell us in Bible college, you know, you spend an hour getting ready for church with your face and your, your suit and you iron your clothes. Some of us did, but in Bible college, I had to iron some of the boys' clothes. But, you know, we get ready for church. It takes us hours. But how much do we get our heart ready for church? You know, say, oh, I didn't get spoken to that service. That may be your fault. And I hate to break it for you. But get your heart ready. Prepare your heart to meet God each and every service. So don't be content with just getting by. 
They had a delusional perception. They had a delusional perception. They thought they were good. They thought they were okay. But God said, you don't even know that you're wretched. Raise your hand if you're wretched. We should all raise our hands. Right? None of us are perfect. We all have sin in our lives. Right? And he said, you're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. And they're like, miserable? Have you seen my bank account? We are the rich Laodicean church. He said, you're poor. You're naked. You're blind. And that's, this would have been a shock to them. Just like us in America, if God came up and said, hey, you're all these horrible things, you're like, what are you talking about? We're doing just fine. And that's the problem. We need to make sure that, hey, we're not okay with just doing just fine. We need to be all out for God and letting God in in everything that we do. And don't uh, delude the perception. They, they lost perception of their own sins. You know, God still hates sin. Regardless if it's a little sin or a big sin, God hates sin. All of it. You know, I love the verse that the thing that David did displeased the Lord. God didn't say, well, that one's okay. No, God hates all sin. And anytime we harbor sin or we excuse sin or we'll confess it and then go right back, that's the confess and forsake. But we don't like to forsake it. We just confess it and then go back to it. That is letting God out. And we need to let God in. So it's too prideful. Don't be too prideful to repent. Get the oppositions out of the way. So those are the oppositions. God's knocking, being prideful, I'm going to forget my own point, being prideful, being lukewarm, knowing that God knows what you're doing and not caring a bit about it, that is going to stop God from coming in. Now, if I were to say, you know, raise your hand if you want God to be involved in your life, we'd all raise our hand. Raise your hand if you want God to be involved in our church, we'd all raise our hand. But these are the things that we need to get out of the way to stop the opposition of going against God. And then number two, there's a promise of a holy encounter. A promise of a holy encounter. Read it with me in verse 20. But I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And I will sup with him and he with me. God never once, you know, says, can I have a rain check? Now, hey, I'm really busy this week. I can't come over. And I, I understand that. School's getting started. I'm, we, me and my wife, we're getting real busy. We're doing different things in the summer league. And someone will be like, hey, Anthony, can I come over to your house tonight? I'd be like, well, I got lesson plans and I got to sleep. And, you know, we're, I, we are busy people. God never says, hey, I'm too busy for you today. Now, I got way too many people praying to me today. You're going to take the back row. No, God is always available. And he always, it's a promise. He's going to meet with you. He's going to meet with us as a church. Why? Because he's a promise of a holy encounter. God never breaks a promise. Not one time. The, I almost got prideful. I said I love this because I thought of it. I love this because God gave it to me. Doubting God's promise is the only thing that can stop it from changing your life. Think about that. Doubting God's promise is the only thing that can stop it from changing your life. I love that book. It's, I think it's called The Promise Book. All the promises in the Bible. You ought to read through that. Those will change your life. Because not one of them is God not going to keep. And you can hold to them. You can pray through them. I mean, call out to me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's a promise. And you can hold on to that. You know, I will provide all, you know, all your needs according to my riches and glory. That's a promise. And you can hold on to that. And you can push through hard times for that in your life. And think of this promise. Knock and I will answer thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So... Many promises in the Bible, if you just believe them, they'll change your life. The, uh, William Carey says the future is as bright as the promises of God. We've heard that before, and I asked Pastor who said that, and he's like, oh, let me look it up. And it's true. As, as bright as your future is, is if you follow God's promises. And why do we say that? Because we got one right here in our text. That if you, if you open the door, I will come in to him. Get a hold of God's promises. God promises to, let, to come in. If we open the door, let God in, let God into your church, let God into your life, let God into your struggles, let God into your joyful times. let God into all of your aspects of life. Everything you need is when you let God into your life. God will provide all that you need. God will provide all your emotional, physical, spiritual needs. Just let him into your life. You know, I know some people, you go through hardships and you, you get angry with God and you block God and you have that opposition, that pride. I'm okay. No, let God into your life. God holds your future. We see A here under promise of a holy encounter. There's a conditional hearing. I didn't want to put that because my last three points had conditional in it, but it worked well. A conditional hearing. In verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice. So the hearing is up to me. The hearing is up to you. God's voice is to everybody. God calls Everybody, everybody in this room ought to hear the voice of God. And if you don't, God is not the problem. 
It's not that God's not talking to you. It's not that God's not trying to reach out to you. It's that you're not listening. And it may be your spiritual attitude that's not ready to hear from God. Or maybe that you're angry with God. Or maybe this opposition that we talked about. But God wants to get involved in your life. We have to do the hearing. We have to do the opening of the door. Listen for the still small voice of God. You know, we always want this big, wonderful, loud thing. And we love the, the you know, the... You know, the different things and the, the, the grand finales of a fireworks show or the, the, the pinnacle note of a cantata. But, you know, God isn't always going to give you this loud, wonderful revelation. Sometimes he'll just speak to you in a still, small voice. Yeah. And the problem is that there's so much noise in the world. You think, you're pretty noisy right now. Exactly, that we can't hear the voice of God. And how do you hear the voice of God? Well, it's just praying out to God. You know, the Bible, uh, not the Bible, they taught us the Bible college, praying is speaking to God and you listening to him in your heart. God will speak to you. I promise you without a doubt, if you seek after God, he will speak to you. And that's not my promise. <laughs> that's God's promise. Amen. God will speak to you. I'll say it a thousand times. God wants to speak to you. Just listen. Just listen to his voice. Amen. Conditional hearing. It's our job to hear. God will speak. God will not Every time we open these church doors, God wants to come in. I believe that. And I believe he comes in many times. And I believe he wants to come in even more in the future. God will come in. As a church, we need to let him in. And like I said before, it's not just up to the pastoral staff. It's up to everybody. We as a church need to take ownership and say, hey, I want God to come into our service tonight. I read a quote. It's not even this message, but it goes with it. Somebody wanted to get a service together and they wanted to get a, a good preacher to really lighten up the, you know, to get a great revival going. They said, well, this is an older time. They said, let's get D.L. Moody. That guy says, what? Does D.L. Moody have a monopoly on God? He says, no, God has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. Amen. He said, D.L. Moody, if you think about that, is that God has all of D.L. Moody. You know what a monopoly is? When one person sells all the certain things? Well, D.L. Moody saying, hey, everything I do is about God. Amen. Everything I do, I want God involved. Every decision I make, I go to God and say, God, what do you want me to do with this one? Amen. You can do that as well. You can have your monopoly on God. You can, you can get all of God that you've ever wanted and even more. God always keeps his promises. Uncondition so there's a conditional hearing. And there it is again, an unconditional entering. What does that mean? It means God's going to come in. And that means if you listen, if you pray, and you cry out to God each and every time, God is going to come in. You may not like the answer. I've had that many times. When God said no, I was like, no, what do you mean? Uh, I'll give you an example. It's just a very sobering example. I remember praying and crying out to God at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning for God to heal my mom. To, to take the tumor away because she had a big surgery that day. And it's always, it was the second surgery and it's difficult, it, almost impossible. Some doctors don't even do it to go in a second time for a brain surgery, for a brain tumor. And I remember when she came out and she came out of the surgery and it was hours. And, it was, you know, we're like, okay, it's only a five hour surgery. Why seven, eight, nine hours go by? But they're like, all right, well, I'm hungry. So my family, we went out to dinner. And I was like, okay, well, guys, I need to go back. I'm not going home. So I went back, and she got a room in the ICU. And they said that, you know, it didn't go as planned. That she didn't come out of the anesthesia like she did last time. And she had a, a brain hemorrhage. If you know what that is, it's uh, bleeding on the brain. And it was, you know, God specifically said no to me. Because I was praying the whole time, every second that she was in that surgery to heal. And God said no. And God has a bigger plan. I remember the first words my mom said to me is when she called. I was in New York, and she called me and said, Hey, Anthony, I have brain cancer. You know, it was a sad moment. We're crying. She said, God has a bigger plan. And we can hold on to that, and I can hold on to that. But that's true. God has a bigger plan. We need God involved in our plans because his plan is bigger than our plan. And be okay if God says no. It's not easy. I can tell you that. It's not easy. But it is worth it when you go with God's plan. Amen. So go with God's plan. Get God involved. It's an unconditional entry. God's going to come in and meet with you. We as a church body need always to be ready for God to get in and shake us up. And change us up for his glory. Amen. Now I'm not saying we should get shaken up and rowdy and changed in the wrong direction. But if God wants us to do something. If God wants you to shout amen. If God wants you to give a testimony. God wants you to you know, do something crazy for his glory. Hey pastor can we start a, a, a Tuesday prayer meeting? Hey pastor can we go visiting at this time? I can't make Saturday. Can we start that? God loves that. God gets all involved in that when people want to do more and more for his glory. So let God get in. He's going to come. He's an unconditional entering. And then point number three here is a pathway 
to a miracle is a pathway to a miracle. God wants to do something great. God wants to do something. Sorry, I just got distracted. God wants to do something impossible in every one of your life. But God even more wants to do something impossible in this church. You know, Tom's River is a big town. We have that map out there. And, and, Brother Mike knows I never mark it. But we, we've done many streets that are on there. So if you want to go out, let me know because I've done a lot of them. But I just don't, I don't remember to mark them. But that's a big map. So trust me, there's plenty more that you can do and go out and reach that. Why? Because God is a miracle worker. I remember last week we... Uh, I think Daniel was with, with me. We were out of teen outreach, and we met another guy named Anthony. And, you know, I, I'm not very good at talking to people or connecting, but God's like, here, is an instant connection. Your name is Anthony, his name is Anthony. And he, it was funny, too, because I want a motorcycle, and he had a motorcycle. He drove in on a motorcycle. And he, my favorite dog is a husky, and it's got a husky jumping at the door. I was like, all right, Lord, thank you. This, is one, this one's a little easier. But and he was such a nice guy. He said, hey, I'm new to the area. And I got to talk to him about our church and, and about God and different things. And I, I plan to go back and talk to him because, you know, it's rare to get somebody to talk to you in Tom's River. I understand that. But we got to keep going out because there are people out there like Anthony who need to hear from God. So God is a miracle worker. God can change his life. And I'm just getting convicted now. I need to pray for him and go back out there. But God can do anything. So let her in here. God is vital. God is important to our success. We talked about Joshua today in Sunday school. And, and the key to success is getting a hold of God and reading God's word. The only time success is in the Bible is in Joshua 1 8. Why? Because getting a hold of God is vital. It is the key to seeing revival and seeing miraculous awakenings of God is to let God in. Say, well, that's so basic. Well, then why do we forget that God's got to be involved in everything? Every second of our life, get God involved. And God wants to do the impossible. So God is vital. And God can overcome. It says in verse 21, Revelation 3, 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his right, in, in his throne. I mean, how amazing that God overcame. I love that phrase. It just wowed my mind when I read it this afternoon. I mean, I studied it before, but I you know, went through my message again. I was like, oh my goodness, how did I miss that? Will I grant to sit with me in my throne. You know, God wants you to be so involved. God wants to be so involved in your life that he, it's almost like, you see, put it here, that you sit with me in my throne. Meaning, you know, you're, I think of the millennial kingdom where we're going to rule and reign with God. You know, God is not going to look down at us and it's like, oh, you know, silly humans, do as I say. No, God wants a relationship Amen. with you. God loves you to the point where he wants to be involved in your life. You know, I think about how amazing, I think of a, a parent, you know, coming to a basketball game. I think of my dad would always work, and every time after work, he'd run down and come watch my basketball games. And, you know, just you know, the almost cliche of, you know, a parent watching a, a sports game. But it's amazing. Why? Because the parents love their child and they want to be involved. You know, God is your loving father, and he wants to be involved in your life. You have to let him. You have to let him. You gotta, you gotta open the door. He's knocking. He's not just gonna come through the door and make himself known and do everything that he wants to do, even if you don't want to know God. You have to open the door, and God wants to do something great in your life. No matter the battle, God is overcome. Every enemy you face, every battle you face, God is overcome. Yeah, I think of myself, oh, school starts tomorrow. What a horrible battle that I have to face because I'm not prepared. Well, God can overcome. They say, oh, well, the, the, you know, the big bosses are in, and, and nothing's ready, and we have to clean the whole building. I don't know what I'm doing with this stress and anxiety. God can overcome that. Say, oh, this family member's coming over, and they don't like how I'm a Christian, and, and I want to witness to them, but I just don't know how God can overcome that. You know, the fear and anxiety that you may struggle with because of certain situations, that you know, God can overcome that. Now, I've experienced that many times in my life, just anxiety for no reason. If you've experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. And, and God can overcome that. You know, reading the verses like casting all your care upon him. Reading verses, uh, you know, Philippians 4, 16 just helps with those different things. God can overcome any battle. And Romans 8, 37 says we are more than conquerors. So we're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors. I mean, we, I love that song, the, the, the winning side. Oh, my goodness. We are winning all the time. You know me, I love to win. And that's a great thing as a Christian that we are on the winning side. I remember in college we would use the hymnals and, and, and 272 was the winning side because every time, who wants to sing a song? Who has a favorite song? I have a 272. And it was just a wonderful, or 91, which is what a day that will be. Those are two of my favorite songs. Why? Because we're going to heaven and it's all worth it and what we win. We win in the end. We are on the winning side. So we're more than conquerors through Christ. And then letter C under here before my voice leaves me is divine power. 
divine power. Through divine power, we can see miracles. We're never going to see an amazing thing happen in our own life, in our church, if we rely on ourselves. If we don't get God involved in his divine power. Turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 3, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding and great and precious, there it is, promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, and to your faith, uh, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Uh, the first verse is just going down different things that you've got to add to it. His divine power to give you all things that pertain to life and godliness. What does that mean? You have no excuse. If God calls you to do something, you can do it. If God wants you to go soul winning, you ought to go soul winning. If God wants you to pray a little bit longer, you ought to pray a little bit longer. Because his divine power, I mean the power that created the universe, is going to enable you to do that. And you just got to get God involved. You can't have divine power without you know, the divine. You can't have the power that God offers without letting God in and getting God involved. And then Ephesians 3 uh, verse 20 talks about... Well, let's turn there, because if I try to quote it, I'll mess it up. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. It's talking about God's divine power. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. What power is that? That is the Holy Spirit. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So we see here Paul talking to the church. He's not just saying, in your own life, that's great that God can do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. But God is saying to the church, God wants to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think in Ocean County Baptist Church. He wants us to do great things that reach Tom's River, to reach Ocean County. Why? Because we get God involved through his divine power. And then last, number four, is a directed decision. A directed decision. Turn with me back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It's a choice. You have to make the choice to let God in. God is not going to just force himself to make you do everything he wants to do. He gives you a choice. We have a free will. We understand that. that we, we Every day we can make the choice to follow God or we can make the choice before, as we mentioned, to oppose God. No one is going to make this choice for you. Uh, you know, we as you know, pastors and deacons, and we're here to help you make those choices, but it's your choice. You decide, hey, I want God to be involved or I don't. Just let God in. You're not going to regret it. I promise you. You're never going to regret God getting involved in your life. And I said it before, you can't get too radical. You can never have too much God in your life. You can never have God too involved in your life. You know, some people that, you know, you're friends with them, but they're always calling you and always trying to hang out with you. It's like, hey, I'm pretty busy. You know, you like them and it's great, but they're too involved. Well, then God is, you're never going to get too involved in God. God's never going to say, hey, that's enough. You've prayed too much today. Hey, that's enough. How many ministries are you possibly going to do? No, God is excited. God wants you to be all involved in him. Jesus said to the lay of the scenes, they were undesirable because they were okay with being okay. Make the decision. Let God in. And then let it be here the loving rebuke. You know, every time God rebukes you, it's for your good. It's because he yeah. loves you. And I'm, <laughs> it's a lot easier to preach, but not really easy to live. God lovingly rebukes you. God says, hey, that's not good what you're doing. Hey, you're not letting me into that situation. What's up with that? Hey, I, I want to help you make that decision. Don't do it yourself. And we just go ahead and we do whatever we want. That's not letting God in. But God's going to rebuke us. Why? Because he loves us. Don't ever doubt God's love. God loves you so much. Don't ever doubt God's love. Don't oppose him. God rebukes you for your benefit. 
It does not benefit you to do nothing with the rebuke. You say, oh, that's great. I know God loves me and he's rebuking me because he loves me, but then you just go and do whatever you want. No, you uh, apply that to your life. How? By repenting. Amen. By repenting. That's the only way. The Bible doesn't give another option. Hey, well, just... You know, do these 20 Hail Marys and you're okay. No, that's not in the Bible. We have to repent. Jesus' first message was repent. John the Baptist's first message was repent. We see here John saying, be zealous and repent. Don't repent half-heartedly. Don't repent half-heartedly. Don't give God half your heart because he, he doesn't like that. That's not desirable. He doesn't want that anymore. He wants you to repent wholeheartedly. Say, God, I'm done giving you half my life. You can have all of it. I want you to let... I want to let you into my life. I want to let you into my church. Re zealously repent. There's a deliberate chastening. But I skipped it, but that's okay. It's zealous repenting. Be passionate about getting back on track. That is a good thing. It is a good thing to get back on track with God. You say, hey, I faltered. And that, that's not okay, but you can get back on track. It's not okay that you've gone away from God and God's not happy about it, but man, he's happy to get you back into the fold. You're like the prodigal. You see the, the father's looking down the aisle. And he's look, the son's coming down. Why? How does he know he's all the way there? Because he's looking. He's waiting for him. He's, like, he's waiting for his son to come back. And I'm not saying anyone here is a prodigal, but hey, maybe there's parts in your life that you're away from God. God is looking for you to come back. God is looking for you to come back. And he wants you to repent. He doesn't want it half-heartedly. He wants it wholeheartedly. Pouring your heart out to God. God, hey, I'm letting you all in. I'm letting you all in. So God wants you to repent zealously. God's not interested in half-hearted repentance. So let God in tonight. Let him into your life. Let him into this church. Man, God is amazing. God wants to do something. And he wants to use you. What a privilege. What a privilege to serve that God. We need to let God in. The decision is yours. The decision is ours. It's a group decision as a church. Let's let God in. But it's your decision. You as a personal person, and that's a, that's a redundant statement, but you as a person, you have a personal decision with the Holy Spirit living inside you to commune with the Holy Spirit and repent, hey, God, you're all in tonight. I'm all in with you tonight. Open the door and don't shut it. We do that a lot. God, you can come in. Oh my goodness, you want that part of my life? Go over there. Oh, what? The door shut. Whoops. Don't shut the door on God. You say, I would never do that. But we do it every day. And we shut the door on God and say, God, you can't have that part. Open the door and leave it open. We need to come for it. If, if, we need to, if, if you have a situation, if you have a, a need or, or something where you need to let God in, come forward and pray. And don't be satisfied with half-hearted repentance. Don't be okay with being okay. And God is not okay with you being okay. That's a lot of okay, and that's okay. <laughs> God wants you to be all in. Zealously repent and turn to God. Let's pray. Yes, God. God, I thank you for just the love that allows us to have this message. God, the fact that you love us so much that you would give us the privilege of letting you into our lives. God, letting you into our church, God, what a blessing to have this wonderful church and this wonderful pastor, God, that's just on board with preaching the Bible and staying true to the book, God, when so many are. And, and God, just the messages that we hear each and every Sunday, God, I pray that we <laughs> heed to them. But God, I pray that we would come ready to hear from you. God, that we would want you in our church, that we as a church body would let you in. God, that we would go soul winning and reach our community. God, that we would be all in for you. And God, I pray that we would, if we need to, God, to repent zealously. God, to just, just allow you to work into our hearts tonight. God, I love you. I thank you, God, for loving me. And being too good to me, God, I don't deserve it. And God, I pray you'd help us tonight in this invitation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing as you're all on the altar laid as we're singing tonight. Maybe you need to come and pray tonight. What doors have you locked against the Lord? Where is he trying to get in? Why don't you come tonight and unlock those doors? Open them up. Let the Lord in and let God do something special in your life. Let's sing this.
October 23rd, and we really do need some people to sign up. Some things are as easy as handing kids tickets when they play their game, and some we need a cleanup crew and a setup crew. So anything you can do, if you only have a few hours, come for a few hours, we'll take it. We need a lot of hands to help us with that. And, and, and there's another way that you can help. You can pray for us. As a, I made a slide, but you couldn't read it, so I had to fix it. But there's a, a pray <laughs> section, so you can pray for us, pray for the Harvest Rally. You know, you know there, last year we had about 90-some to 100 teens, and you know, we want God to meet with them. We want God to change their lives and speak to them. And then the other one was play, was come and help us. And then the last one is pay. You know, it costs a lot of money. If you want to donate towards that, you know, we greatly appreciate it. So you can just give it to the officer and offering and just put Harvest Rally. Thank you. Amen. And I want to remind you also that uh, on Sunday nights, we want to get the Patch Club going. And uh, so if you can help out with Patch, be sure to see me or Pastor Dewan. We can get you signed up for that and get the material ready for you to be able to do that. We'd like to be able to have the children come on Sunday nights to be able to learn how to sing and be able to get them in church singing. And so if you can uh, help out, that would be a wonderful thing. Uh, God is doing some great things. I mentioned this morning we had four saved at the funeral yesterday that I did. And then this morning I had a fellow when I was, uh, he had talked to me last week about getting baptized. He's an older guy and uh, he hasn't been here for a while and he just came back out uh, because he was out for the pandemic and all that stuff. But uh, anyway, he talked to me last week about being baptized. And then this morning in the invitation, I didn't see his hand. But when he was leaving, he told me, he said, I raised my hand. I needed to be saved. I need to be baptized. And I was like, hallelujah. I said, man, that's an exciting thing uh, to see that God can touch someone, whether you're young or whether you're old, God can still save your soul. Right. And uh, we need to open the door of opportunity. Amen. Amen. And so let's unlock the door. Amen. Let's let the Lord in. Maybe he'll let us out and do something for him. Amen. So let's uh, pray tonight. Uh, Pat, no, I think I'll pray. Why don't you stand by the door and they can yell at you when they go out. <laughs> let's pray. God, you're so good. Uh, we praise you, Lord. It's amazing uh, what we can see take place uh, when we just open the door. And so, Lord, I pray that you bless us tonight in a great way. Uh, lay on our hearts what it is you want us to do. Uh, reveal to us our, our gifts, our talents that we have. And Lord, may we surrender everything that we are to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight. <laughs>